Hello and welcome to our next simulation episode where we last left off, we introduced a patient, elderly, who had shock physiology, presumably from sepsis, of a pulmonary source. And the first episode, if you haven't seen it, I would highly recommend you go back and check that out, which laid the premise to our resuscitation uh, in the pre-hospital field for a patient with severe sepsis and septic shock with the use of push dose epinephrine as well as epinephrine infusion or what we uh, colloquially refer to as a dirty epi drip to optimize the hemodynamics and in fact improve the shock index. Um, one, to not only uh, help the resuscitative outcomes but also in preparation for stabilizing our patient's hemodynamics prior to an advanced airway. And we noted that um, our patient's vital signs after initial IV fluid crystalloid infusion, as well as several doses of push dose pressor, did in fact improve. We also noticed that we placed uh, nasal cannula on at 15 liters per minute, and the oxygen saturation improved from an initial room air sat in the 70s to 81%. And Perhaps we'll take a moment to do a separate episode on uh, what we call apneic oxygenation or high flow nasal cannula. What we refer to in that specific scenario, the nomenclature can get a little bit confusing, but this is a standard nasal cannula that's turned all the way up to 15 liters per minute. And if this is a practice that is not familiar to you, what we'll do is in the show notes, we'll link up to uh, Mr. Mcrit, uh, mcrit.org backslash preoxygenation, which is a must read for anybody that approaches the advanced airway. So to begin this particular episode, we noticed that despite our initial resuscitative efforts, the hemodynamics have improved, the shock index is now closer to one. However, our patient still has an oxygen saturation of 81%. And for the sake of simulation, let's just say our patient is hypoxic and is agitated, and we initially tried to place a CPAP on the patient to improve our oxygenation, however, they were unable to tolerate that. So what we'll do in this next episode is talk about how we can use ketamine pre-hospitally to in fact bring a concept that we're beginning to explore more and more in the emergency department, delayed sequence intubation for adequate pre-oxygenation, we can in fact bring that to the pre-hospital space. So stand by, uh, Dr. Tanis is coming in hot. So our patient is still hypoxic, despite high flow oxygen, and uh, we talked a little bit about shunt physiology, where we need to recruit our alveoli, we need the PEEP to overcome this, this VQ mismatch where we're not getting, we're not ventilating our patient. So our patient is uh, hypoxic and agitated and won't tolerate our CPAP masks. And there's a couple different CPAP masks available out there. Um, this version here that I have today runs on standard oxygen tubing here, and you turn this up to 15 liters a minute, and it provides uh, 10 cms of water peep to our patient. So if our patient is agitated and won't tolerate this mass, we can try talking to them and, and reassuring them that we're here to help them, we're not suffocating them, and uh, if, if that doesn't work, we may need to intervene with pharmacology. So we have a couple different choices. You know, we have benzodiazepines we, for sedatives, we have opiates for analgesia, and we have ketamine, which is really just anesthesia. It's a dissociative anesthetic that's available, ideal for this situation. Um, it, it actually increases or, or, or optimizes um, our blood pressure by increasing our blood pressure. Um, so on our hypotensive patients, ketamine is a great drug to go to. In this situation, we can dissociate our patient, in, keep our re airway reflexes intact, keep somewhat of a, of a spontaneous respiratory effort, and uh, try and resuscitate our patient from a, the hypoxic state they're in now with a little bit of ketamine. So we can slowly push a milligram per kilogram of ketamine to try and bring our patient to that dissociative dose. So if our patient here is 100 kilograms, we can slowly push 100 to 200 milligrams, so 1 to 2 milligrams per kilogram of ketamine into our patient to help uh, dissociate them and be able to have them tolerate the, the CPAP or, and, and the PEEP that they need to try and uh, optimize their, their oxygen saturation. So as we give them the, the ketamine slowly, um, we can talk them and reassure them to uh, help them tolerate the mask by just holding it on their face at first and getting to a point where we can actually buckle, buckle it on their face and move on to other uh, aspects of their care. 
So remember, our goals of care here is to try and fix the hypoxic state, fix the hypotensive state prior to induction of RSI medications. So almost like a delayed sequence induction, where the delay is we're going to try and optimize the things that are broken, fix the tachycardia, fix the hypotension, fix the shock, and get them to a point where it's safer to intubate our patients. So as we watch our, our monitor, we've added peak to the scenario. So this is a fixed peak device at 10 cm's of water of our um, peak uh, of our positive end expiratory pressure. So we're breathing out against a force to try and splint those alveoli open, trying to recruit them so we actually start ventilating more of the lung to try and increase our saturation. So as we look, our saturation has come up um, to 95%. So now we are optimizing our oxygenation we're giving our fluids and our push dose pressors, and we've come a long way from our initial impression of this patient. So with these new with these next steps in management, aside from the fluid resuscitation and conventional oxygen administration, adding push dose pressors and adding um, continuous positive airway pressure and PEEP or positive end expiratory pressure to our patients, we can optimize them to get ready for an intubation attempt. So we've given ketamine already, so our patient is dissociated, spontaneously breathing, and now uh, we can assess them to see if we want to paralyze our patient. And that's going to be our difficult airway assessment. Probably another podcast into itself to predict the difficult airway. But if we don't see any markers of our lemon assessment, if we can palpate our cricoid thyroid membrane for our surgical backup, if we can see that the anatomy will more than likely tolerate a superglottic airway as a backup, so we go into our airway management situation with a plan that we're find the patient who's hypotensive, hypoxic, and uh, in shock, we optimize our vital signs through delayed sequence induction, plan out our airway attempts. So pre-hospital, normally we would do a direct laryngoscopy with a sedative and a paralytic. We've given our sedative, which is ketamine, ahead of time to help dissociate our patient to tolerate positive pressure ventilation or, or, or non-invasive ventilation strategy to increase that oxygenation prior to sedating and paralyzing them. High flow nasal cannula on the patient underneath the mask. So when it's time to remove the mask, we're still providing oxygen when our patient needs it the most in a situation where apneic oxygenation. And then um, we can give our medications and, and prepare to intubate our patient. So our airway plan is going to be plan A is going to be direct laryngoscopy with endotracheal intubation. Plan B is to, uh, if direct laryngoscopy fails, a supraglottic airway. And if we ever encounter a situation where we can't intubate and we can't ventilate our patient, it becomes an airway emergency, we move to our surgical backup, which is uh, cricothyrotomy. 